Well, joining us now to further unpack some of the themes around South Africa's education system is Liz Burrows. She's Senior Manager for Qualifications, Curriculum and Certification at Umalusi. And over in Cape Town is Education Analyst Graham Block as well. Welcome to you both and thanks so much for joining us. Liz, let's perhaps start off with you here and get some perspective from your end as to where you see our education system right now, given the kind of investment that we're making in this space. I mean, we've got one of the highest budget spending on education in the world. It makes up 20% of GDP. Alicia, it's a huge amount of money. Um, but I, I think we also forget where we've come from. Um, I think one of the remarkable things that have happened since 1994 is that we've moved from 16 departments of education to one. We've moved from 16 different standards of education to a single standard. And I think what we are seeing indeed is that uh, almost on a provincial basis, we can see where things were extremely bad um, in the past. Um, your, your reporter Candace reported on how poorly we do in pearls, but one of the interesting things is that if you go and look at our performance in 2001 and 2011, surprisingly we find that within our own band we have moved up S a significant number of points, a number, in fact, like a grade and a half mm -hmm. during those 10 years. So I, I think what, we're, what I'm saying is we're moving from a very low base and that what we're doing is we're moving very slowly. I think there are difficulties that have been identified in, in your presentation. I think, for, first of all, um, schools are poorly equipped. Mm -hmm. Teachers have not been brought up to, up to date. I think Michael Young from the Institute of Education says South Africa is the only country that radically changed its education system without creating a new cadre of teachers. And not only have we not done that, we have continued to change the curriculum at an absolutely stunning That's exactly pace. It. So at that point, let's bring Graham into the conversation here because Graham, we've seen a constant shift in South Africa's educational curriculum and uh, you know where accountability was uh, highlighted and the lack of that accountability was highlighted in that insert a short while ago. It seems that we're not holding anybody accountable for the missteps we're taking in this evolving system, a system that uh, seems to be evolving too fast to keep up with. Look, I think what you're saying is absolutely key. And the question is, um, when teachers and government, who are the two key stakeholders, are at war, who's going to get hurt? It's just the kids are going to get the bullets, and we're going to have to dodge them. So I think we're in a, in a lot of trouble. We know that, not just from SACMEC, which is the Southern African Consortium, but also from our own figures. We know that we're not getting the basics or the high-level skills to put spaceships up where we need to see the stars in the southern skies to um, solve the problems of malaria, some of those issues, and AIDS. I think we've got some of those problems, and we've also got huge inequalities in education. So I think we're in trouble. We need to have a big discussion about what we want education to be. And Liz has, I think, pointed to some of the problems. But also, I suppose the question is, what are the solutions and how do we get So there? let's get to it, because where it comes to accountability, first of all, one has to uh, start assessing the kind of mechanisms we should be employing to ensure that there is accountability in the system, there is transparency in the system. So what kind of mechanisms should we be employing, Graham? Look, I think we're going to have to go back to some form of inspectors. I think it's absolutely right that teachers, like all other state employees, account for what they're doing and what they're doing all day long. They've got many problems, and I think the public is very sympathetic to the problems, from infrastructure to size of classes, to the state of the roads, to the health of the kids, lots of problems. But teachers have to rise to the occasion, and they have to be civil servants 
of whom we can be proud. They so can't do it alone, though, Liz. So uh, let's get your view there. I mean, we've, uh, of course, had uh, being highlighted as a problem, teacher late coming, absenteeism, inability to enact the basic functions of, te uh, of teaching as a whole as a problem. But surely they need support as well. We need uh, support from the educational department as a whole. And uh, we need to see the educational departments deliver on their core responsibilities and competencies as well. I, I think there are, are really major shortcomings almost at every level of the system. And um, I think it starts with teacher training and uh, Oma Lucy is now engaging both the DBE and the DHET around teacher training. We've done quite a lot of work on the curriculum and I think it's quite clear that the fundamentals of the curriculum are actually quite sound. They, we keep tinkering with it but actually that's not where the problem lies. The problem does lie in the implementation of the curriculum. I think we often spend a lot of time talking about the issues of, of maths and science, mm -hmm. but we all neglect the notion or the idea that language is really important. And I, I think if one looks at the changes that are being made in the CAPS, yes, there is a focus to bring the language of learning and teaching, which is often English, but sometimes in, uh, in places like the Western Cape, also Afrikaans, lower down into the system. But we're not acknowledging the critical role of the, of, the, of the child's home language in terms of that child's identity, um, his or her ability to develop those cognitive demands that I think Clem was talking mm -hmm. about. Actually, those need to be developed from from the time the child is six weeks old and able to share attention with a parent. The, um, there was a Nobel Prize winner in the last few years who said that anything after um, the age of five is actually remedial education, which is a terrifying thought. But really it does mean that those early childhood years are the critical, critical years for us to start working on. But when we get to schools, then we have to make sure that the kids are well, are well taught in terms of their own mother tongue and in terms of other languages which become the language of Graham, is that teaching. something you agree with, being taught in your mother tongue? Because a debate was raging around that uh, not so long ago, whether that should be enforced, whether that should be implemented. Because yes, while it does uh, you know, open up opportunity to an extent, it does close opportunities as well in terms of what's possible at later stages, the kind of world these learners have access to. Look, all the experts are telling us that if you learn in your home language, that's the way to go, and then you switch. And you know, if you're in China, you learn in Chinese. If you're in Japan, you learn in Japanese. And it doesn't stop you competing on the world stage. The problem is exactly what Liz said, is there good teaching in whatever language? So I think language is an issue. We mustn't discount it. We mustn't be arrogant about English, although people will have to switch, I think, to a language like English, and we need to look at that more. And we also need to look at what we need for language. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve everything if we only get the language issues right. It's one of many issues. And as I said, it's language, it's curriculum, it's getting the teachers to actually teach the curriculum, and it's also uh, the poverty issues, the wider issues of resources in the schools. Let's, lo let's schools look at labs, resources, um, Graham. Let's look at resources a little bit more in depth there, because if you're looking at a broadening of, uh, you know, the language in which uh, subjects are taught, for example, you're going to need even more resources. We're looking at a country here with 11 official languages. Just how much more of a challenge does this bring to the table? Look, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, education is very expensive, and there's not going to be any cheap way of getting there. But at the moment, we're wasting a lot of money, and I think that's what's being said about the value for money debate. But the question is still, when you build libraries, as the kids are demanding, it's going to cost a lot of money when you build roads, when you build proper water and connections, internet connections to schools. That's going to cost a lot of money, but I think South Africans are ready to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And I just think they need to know it's going to the right place. Liz, I can see you're nodding on this end, so you're <laughs> in consensus with what Graham's bringing to the table. Yes, I, I, I think very, very much so. Um, I, I often think we, we forget the ba some of the basics. 
I remember I, when I was at the HSRC many years ago, Cecile Bardenhorst, who was in childhood development there, said, you know, we'd probably do better if we just gave, peop gave kids two square meals a day. You know, in just in terms of how do you learn when you're hungry and how do you learn when there's no toilet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think we do need to look at those, those areas of, that are neglected. But I, th I think our greatest resource potentially are our teachers. So let's look at them. Uh, should we be reopening teacher training colleges specifically? Many have said they provide a focused approach in the development of teachers and instill a sense of pride amongst teachers, uh, you know, in general. Well, I'm, you know, I, I don't know that I would want to comment one way or the other, but I do think the, the, that the issue of higher education for teachers and how they are taught is one of the areas where Umalusi is now starting to engage quite seriously because what we've seen in the curriculum has actually led us to believe that teachers are not understanding the curriculum well enough and not getting sufficient insight into the academic disciplines that they're supposed to be teaching or indeed the kinds of assessment that would make for meaningful and exciting learning, mm -hmm. um, both in the classroom and ultimately also in formal assessment. In your view, Graham, is there enough of a national program, a national focus uh, to equipping the supply of your basics, like your learning materials, the provisions of libraries, uh, you know, maintenance of desks, basic infrastructure that a school needs, and then uh, you know, skills development as well when it comes to that teacher base? Look, I think that the Eastern Cape routinely ignores court orders around my schools. And I think I heard from the kids in equal education in Limpopo this weekend, they're very disturbed by the new norms and standards for physical infrastructure of the minister. So I think there's a lot of work. Many schools don't have water, they don't have staff rooms. The staff are entitled to a place to put their books and to talk to kids. We don't have, uh, as we said, toilets or running water or often roads to the schools. So I think there's a lot of fixing that has to be done. And I mean, I think, agree that teachers, despite everything, must, must not use this as an excuse. They have to see what they can do, despite all the problems. Because those problems are not going to disappear immediately, and the world is not going to feel sorry for us. So who can we extract um, lessons from? Uh, who's getting uh, uh, their model right, you know, a working model right now that we can certainly lear learn from? I mean, the, the PAC highlighting specifically that we've got the governments of Kenya and Zimbabwe spending a whole lot less on their education system and getting more right than we are. Mm. Look, I, you know, I, I think we, ha we have to recognize that, you know, Kenya and Zimbabwe are much further along the line in a post-independence sense than we are. Um, and that, that maybe if we went back and looked at Kenya in the early 80s, we might be saying some of the things that we are seeing now. I don't think we really have begun to come to grips with some of the serious, serious issues. And I'm not, in a, I'm not a kind of post-apartheid apologist. I think the ANC has to take responsibility fair and square for what is happening. But I think the, I think the, the larger environment, the larger cultural environment, is, is one which is still battling with many of the issues that came from pre-1994. I mean, I think this issue of, la of language is, is one of them. Um, but I also think that one of the things that we need, we need to look very carefully at is the minister said, for example, that the standards of the exams are quite good. Mm -hmm. And indeed, a, a lot of the research that Umalusi is doing is showing that. But the fact is kids are not being able to deliver on that level. Exactly, and that, and that brings that the focus that to is the quality the, that of is education the and is. the quality of uh, the actual uh, uh, skill that we're putting out there into the workforce at the end of the day. Liz, let's leave it there. Thanks so much for having joined us today. Of course, uh, thanks to Graham as well. Liz Burrows is a Senior Manager for Qualifications Curriculum and Certification at Umalusi, and Education Analyst Graham Block, of course, joined us from our studios in Cape